Well, my, myself, my staff, and our sources, uh, we believe uh, in some kind of romantic ideal. It's quite a, a quaint notion. It's quite a uh, unclinical notion. It's quite a notion, in fact, that uh, perhaps in some ways doesn't belong uh, to this time. It belongs to an older time uh, or perhaps a future time, uh, which is that um, through understanding the world, we can do something sane. We can do something rational. Um, it's not uh, something of a, a, a thing out of a postmodernist view uh, of extremely bounded uh, rationality uh, where everything is kind of pointless. No, we actually think um, it's fascinating uh, to understand the world around us and through this understanding uh, we can see justice come from it as we have in, in many cases, uh, some of which uh, Sarah had pointed out. Uh, in fact, you can break down um, this quest uh, for knowledge and understanding into really the three types of history. By history, uh, uh, journalists will understand that uh, I don't mean what happened 100 years ago, or not only what happened 100 years ago. I mean history circa now, uh, the history uh, that is unfolding all around us. What are the three types? So type one, uh, the, the history which is subsidized, uh, where there is an economic interest in propelling it and promoting it. Uh, that, of course, includes all kinds of advertising and propaganda, uh, but it, it also includes very basic things, uh, such as uh, how to hammer in particular types of nails, how to, how to build a pump, uh, how to fly an aeroplane. Extremely important information, uh, but one that has an existing industry propelling it forth into the world. Uh, type two history. And this is unsubsidized history. History which has lost its economic subsidy. Knowledge which is no longer propelled in the world, but sits there and perhaps slowly decays. Uh, that's important to try in some cases to drive that knowledge, but generally speaking, uh, it's not kept around because the people don't find it interesting enough to keep around. And then there's the type three history, uh, and that is the type uh, that WikiLeaks is involved in and that I have been interested in uh, all my adult life, and that is subjugated history. It is the history where there is an active effort uh, to prevent it entering into the world. And this uh, type of history, uh, if we can find it, if we can uh, grab hold of it, if we can pull it in uh, to civilization and our collective memory, this is a type of history uh, that would not have otherwise existed. Um, that's true for nearly every document public. It would not have otherwise existed uh, as something to be discussed uh, by uh, people of different languages and different cultures. Um, a good example of that uh, is, uh, say, the Iraq or Afghan war logs. That's uh, a, um, a rich uh, documentation of the history of a war, and in fact, the history of two countries and that would not have otherwise uh, being present for the people of those countries or for the other countries that were embroiled in those wars to understand and, and derive lessons from. So through uh, collecting this type of knowledge, subjugated history, uh, we have built uh, this romantic ideal um, of a grand rebel library. That's what WikiLeaks is, a rebel library, a, a type of library of Alexandria, uh, I think Alexandria, I think we probably have more documents than Alexandria, uh, but it is uh, a library that is not like any other library. Um, we have the first uh, moment of what we bring into the world being present, as opposed to uh, copies of other books, which might be interesting, but uh, we're in the quest of trying to find original documents that have never been seen before and bringing them uh, into our collective knowledge understanding. 